At MMV, I'd like to introduce the uh, keynote uh, speaker, uh, who is, of course, Dr. Morgan uh, McGuire. So uh, Morgan is a chief scientist at Roblox, and he's here to tell us all about the exciting stuff that they're doing uh, with respect to Roblox um, in terms of the technical challenges and uh, whether that be the current technical challenges or the future technical challenges as, as they're going forward. So uh, I suppose we'll just uh, get Dr. Morgan on the stage here and um, switch over. So thanks. Thank again. you, Thomas. All right, well, thank you very much, Connor. Uh, thank you to Niall and Millen. Beautiful Athlon, Ireland. And uh, I have to say, this is, I feel like I'm probably the least experienced person uh, in the room. So it's, it's quite an honor to, to have an opportunity to be on the stage. It's a really inclusive conference. There's a lot of great ideas that come out here. and. and it's a community I've been moving towards, and, and so I appreciate being invited to come and speak today. Um, I work for a company called Roblox. Can you, I'm just curious because you're, you're a bit over the, the median age of 13 for the users on our platform, so can you raise your hand if you're familiar with it so I, so I know sort of where we're starting? Okay, that's, that's a lot more than I expected. Wonderful. Um, so I'll give you kind of a, a brief overview, and then, then you can ask your colleagues who, who just raised their hand if it's true. Uh, so we produce a, a platform for 3D social co-experience. There are hundreds of millions of players on this platform and uh, millions of pieces of content. All of the content is created by the players themselves. And so it's 100% user-generated content. That's a really interesting regime for building systems for because we have no control over the load on our platform, the details, the kinds of assets that are appearing on it. Um, the experiences vary from simple chat rooms to whole fantasy role-playing experiences. Some of them are, are more in the category of what we would call serious games. Uh, some are purely social, and, and some are more traditional video game-like experiences. I'll show you some in a moment. Each of those experiences creates its own content universe in the sense that a book or a movie creates a content universe, like we would refer to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for example. What Roblox does, and we don't produce any of the content, remember, with the platform that it runs on, is we take those individual universes and we link them together into a metaverse so that you can move between experiences and have a consistent avatar, have a consistent inventory, consistent currency, and your friends. And so unlike most 3D experiences where you show up and all of the state is new and you you're given a character and there's no consistency, this is instead what Neil Stevenson called the metaverse, the idea of you bring stuff with you into the experience. And that's also a unique challenge because it means that different media that were never intended to be put together, whether audio or video or 3D or animation, are suddenly getting jammed together and our system has to resolve that and do all of the balancing for it. Um, it's a lot like the web in terms of browsing through experiences and dropping into different things and constantly streaming. Except imagine that every website had the same login and, and sort of brought the same user experience with you so that you, you could go between different content providers and have a certain level of consistency. The technology that we've built is a very large distributed system. Uh, it handles both the multimedia creation side because it's all user-generated content as well as the presentation. And we target a huge range of devices. So a single experience, even if authored, say in a desktop context, will run on not just different operating systems but on mobile, on, on different form factors, on consoles, and in virtual reality. And so there's an awful lot of um, you know, cross-device transfer that has to happen. And our platform today is unique at the scale that it's at. But I think it's representative of the direction that things are going. That this is just like the communication technology challenge at one point was it was building the analog telephone and the digital telephone system, and then the internet, and then the web on top of the internet. We think that this is the next direction that everyone's going, that this is the challenge for research and engineering. And so I hope that my talk today is, I'll start by grounding it in concrete examples from Roblox, 
but I'm really addressing what I think is an industry-wide move in the kinds of systems that, that everyone needs to build, not just something that's happening particular to our company. So today I'll, I'll describe these metaverse systems challenges and present some of the you know, modest, pragmatic successes that we've had towards those, but then put that in the context of a larger challenge and a larger vision. So, so not you know, what have we happened to have built in our company, but what have we learned from that about what we think the future challenges are, especially for internet streaming media? And then propose a, a specific research agenda that we're pursuing and that I would invite this community um, to collaborate on as well. If you look at the scaling challenges um, for interactivity, they're very different than what's happened for all other areas that have gone to distributing cloud systems. So, there are great successes for things like email or streaming static video, like, so Netflix, um, and then systems, uh, you know, social media and, and, and all these kinds of things. The way these have succeeded at scaling, the back-end systems, is that they drove up the total cost of ownership dramatically compared to sort of a, a non-scalable single core system. So there's a huge amount of overhead to amortize. And that works for some business models, but if you want this to be commercially accessible, and, and Roblox, for example, it, it's free to play on. Our, our business model is we sell things into a virtual economy. And so you need to really lower the cloud cost of ownership for the provider. It need, needs to be at the you know, level of cents per user. Um, otherwise, you end up in a business model where you're sort of driven by other things and, and other ways of monetizing. So this needs to be sort of affordable. It needs to be incredibly efficient on the server side is what I'm saying, which means distribution, amortization, and client-side computing need to be involved. And also interaction requires low latency. And so we work in a world of milliseconds of latency compared to traditional systems, so things like serverless computing, um, MapReduce, distributed databases. The way they get their efficiency is with large amounts of queuing and large amounts of load balancing. And so they talk about you know, seconds of latency, in some, some cases minutes. Um, so it's a very different way that, say, you know, high-performance computing has gone in the past from where it needs to go for these interactive 3D systems. So let me start by showing uh, sort of a motivating video. This is content from Roblox platform, except for about three seconds, everything in here was created by players. So we created the backend system, but pr players created the experiences, and it'll focus on kind of video game-like content to give you an idea of what players are seeing and the level of interactivity in the platform. Everything here is recorded real time in, in engine, so it's edited together, but it's not a produced video.
experiences. Um, those would normally be very, very different systems to provide each of those. And on Roblox, that's all unified, and, and it's just whatever the user-defined content is, that's what we have to support. Um, that real emphasized game-like experiences. We also have um, huge music concerts. These will have millions of people simultaneously attending these as, as virtual concerts um, for sort of, you know, popular acts. Um, they have fairly sophisticated needs when it comes to, to synchronizing audio, video, and 3D animation in real time for, for a concert. So that particular domain is, is especially interesting. And then we also have a lot of brands now coming on the platform and creating all kinds of different experiences, whether they're sports, fashion, um, food has been very popular even though you obviously can't eat it in the virtual world. And so they have very particular needs about the way that we present their logos, their content, the colors there as well. So it's kind of the union of all of the constraints of every different area of media is, is what we inherit. Um, and some of the experiences are also, I just wanted to call out, these are some of my, my favorite, um, just to, to get that sense of that radical diversity, they go from, at the top left, uh, or top right, Tiefel's library, this is a, a player created mostly by children library where thousands of books, every book is actually written by a kid and they can just put it in the library and you walk around in 3D and you can pull out and open the book and read it. Um, and it's just an amazing experience that sort of kids all around the world would, would you know, not make a video game that, that's about shooting or sports or something. They made a video game that's about reading books and I, I just absolutely love that. Um, and then down to on the lower left, that's the virtual twin of our physical campus. We, we've built a complete reproduction at the beginning of COVID so that everyone in the company could get together in an embodied way, even though we couldn't all come to campus originally. So that, that's sort of the, the scope of things that we're looking at. Um, in terms of, of quantitatively, we launched in 2006, so we, we've been building for quite some time. Today, our, our scale is we have 55 uh, da million daily active unique users. That's a quarter of a billion unique players logging in every month. Um, nine million of those are creating the content as well. So it's, it's not everyone, but it's a fairly large distribution of people. Uh, I said our median age, about 13, so half under, half over 13. And they're fairly equally distributed between Europe, the US and Canada, um, Asia Pacific, and then rest of the world. So we have a fairly good geographic distribution, which includes people communicating and creating in 45 different languages in 180 countries. So lots of different regulatory regimes in lots of different languages, and I'll get to those challenges in a moment. Um, the platform that we've created is, is something that's it's this long envisioned science fiction idea. Um, I mentioned Neil Stevenson earlier as sort of one of the um, you know, many, unfortunately, dystopian <laughs> views of the metaverse. We're trying to create the utopian metaverse, and so we've learned a lot both from the web um, and from lessons from science fiction thought about, you know, how do we put strong privacy controls and safety and moderation in in order to build things right the first time. And as I said before, I, I think that we've built a specific platform, but I think it's representative of a kind of challenge that many other country, companies are now looking at going forward. And, and you're certainly hearing about that in the news, I think, daily. From that, I would generally categorize that vision where we're concretely looking for Roblox in the next few years is, of course, 100% user-generated content. Some of those users are professional game developers, media creators, engineers. Um, some of them are 10-year-olds, so, so huge. Uh, range of abilities represented there, and we want to enable people at all areas of that professional spectrum. Moderated assets and communication, so everything that goes to the platform has to be presented in a way that's um, region appropriate, that's age appropriate, that's culturally appropriate, and so we have to categorize and in some cases moderate. And we're, we have, I said, 250 million monthly active players. We think getting to something like an eighth of the world's population, so, so a billion players is sort of a, a good target for where we think that's self-sustaining in the future. Um, and something, player density is, is really hard. Most uh, typical video games tap out at about 100 players today if they're, they're highly interactive. Uh, we think something like 50,000 players represents, that's the scale of a large music festival, a university, um, 
you know, all of Athlone. <laughs> uh, so, so that's kind of a size that we think is, is, is useful, that, that you should be able to interact at that scale. Um, beyond 50,000 players, it sort of doesn't matter because that's kind of a reasonable working set. You're not going to have an interaction with a million people, but you could, you could sort of see 50,000 people in an amphitheater or spread out in a field. This vision translates into some specific challenges, and this is exactly what, what I work on every day. So for the user-generated content, that turns into a creativity challenge. It's tools that are everything from programming to, to 3D modeling and animation. So all of the content authoring, making that accessible to everyone. For the moderated assets, well, that's about community. Lots of natural language processing, lots of artificial intelligence for computer vision, ways of understanding, categorizing content, helping people discover it, and making sure that what they do discover is appropriate for them. And then in terms of the player size, that's this core technical scalability challenge. It's all about distributed systems. And that's what I'm going to go to the deepest on today. So in my job, I get to work with, as chief scientist, uh, several teams that are all focused on innovation at different time scales. Um, that begins with our fundamental research team. This is an academic style team, open source, open data, publishing. Um, we have Tanya Lorita Botran today in the audience with us. Um, she is from the research team. She's an expert in uh, machine learning for distributed systems. Um, we have 60 PhDs who work on uh, data science and HCI. These are applied scientists. Um, so they use similar methodology to, to all of us as scientists, but they, they apply their results directly within the company rather than generally publishing because of the sensitive nature of what they're working on. And then we have about 1,000 engineers total, um, sort of centralized their headquarters in, in California, but a, a few spread around the world working remotely. And of that, about 200 of them work on fairly advanced projects um, that are sort of in the R&D category. Um, from the media engineering team, we have Sandeep, are you in the room? Um, we have uh, Sandeep Kanumuri, um, and knows a lot more than I do about audio and video and streaming and all of these things as well. Um, so please, so I'm calling out my colleagues that you can come talk to all of us because we are really excited to find collaborators both at other companies um, and in academia. And all of these teams that I've described are, are all currently hiring um, both interns but also full-time uh, folks. So we're, we're really excited to be here and learn from you and, and meet you. So, I promised to share some of the, the early successes that these teams have had, and so let me dive into that now. On the creativity side, we have an avatar clothing system which lets you track, uh, lets you put any clothes on top of um, any avatar, and that's a really hard challenge. This, this has been an open problem for many years for, for real-time characters. In fact, until fairly recently, it was an open problem even for sort of offline for movies, just to put clothes on characters. And the reason is you need to handle the fact that clothing simulation is very difficult, and if you put a sweater over a shirt, you don't ever want the shirt to show through, but you also don't want any sort of collisions between those that would cause an unstable simulation. It looked like your, your sweater was jumping around. And when you start putting many, many layers of clothing, this problem gets harder and harder. And then, of course, we have avatars, as you saw in the intro video, that come in all different shapes and sizes, um, some of which are blocky and cartoonish, some of which are more human, and then even within those categories, there are radically different shapes. And we don't want to create a different t-shirt for each of them. You want to have everything automatically resize and then automatically adapt to different animations. And one of the interesting challenges from the brands I mentioned is, you know, if we have a Nike logo on a T-shirt, when we stretch that shirt or adjust the size to go onto a different character, we don't want the Nike logo to stretch. So there are all these interesting constraints about how do you resize things while sort of preserving the semantics of them. Um, so we did a lot of work on this. Uh, this is stuff that we haven't published this aspect yet. We've focused on shipping it, which just came out about two weeks ago live on the platform. Um, so what I'm showing on these, usually the bibliography is at the end. I've interlaced my bibliography because I, I want to credit all of the related work that we've built on. Um, so when it's work that, that Roblox authors have worked on, I'll put a little Roblox symbol. It's a rotated square. In this case, I'm just showing uh, related work that we've drawn on, so for example, Seth Teller's um, pre-computer visibility work uh, and radial basis functions where this is work by others, and so this is not us. Um, 
here's what our system looks like. This is sort of just a debug view. This, is, this obviously isn't what players see. But you can see that we're moving through radically different kinds of clothing, right? So we're putting this dress on a monster with spikes, on someone who is sort of superhuman, and it's constantly adjusting but trying to maintain the patterning on the outfit and then trying to track all of the different animations as it goes through. Completely different character again, all kinds of different clothing, mixing and matching. And the idea is that you should be able to put those layers on without ever seeing anything through anything else. And then we have to map to all the different animations. So, so stretching realistically and moving with the character, never having the body or, or skin poke through. So I mentioned the radial basis functions, that's sort of the underlying technology for this, and that sort of gradient was showing sort of the, the impact of one function across the body. And then here's the hidden surface removal, showing each layer removing the mesh below it. So creation is not just about geometry. Um, to make interactive experiences, you also have to have code. And we do several interesting things here. Um, one that I want to highlight is, we use a dynamic scripting language. It's called Lua. It's a little bit like Python, if you're familiar with that, or JavaScript. So it's a dynamic, very high-level language, very accessible, very easy for people to learn. And dynamic, level, uh, dynamic languages are also really convenient for, um, you know, we might be putting a 3D mesh or a, piece, a string uh, or audio into a variable. So you, you can sort of work with things at a, at a very high level. When we're working with novice programmers in particular, we want fairly high-level sophisticated tools for helping them create their code. And you know, one of the simplest assistive devices for coding is, is just auto-completion. So in most IDEs, when you're programming, you type the, the name of some object and, and a period, and maybe it lists all the methods or all the properties that you could use. Well, there's a huge challenge when you do this in a dynamic language, which is, in C++ or Java or some language where you've declared the type of a variable, it's very easy for the IDE to tell you all the things you could do with it because you told the system what type of variable it was. In a language like Python or Lua, you can't do that because we don't know the type of the variable. It will vary at runtime. Type inference is a system that's used for assigning types in dynamic languages. So you, so you might know about this from things like, like OCaml or Haskell or, or other languages like that that are functional. We have a fairly sophisticated type inference system. Type inference is a way of assigning types to these dynamic variables and, and, and doing it statically, so before the program is run. You would like to use that in order to provide assistance. So, hey, I've discovered a bug in your program while you're writing it, let me put a red squiggle under it, or let me suggest the method you want to call. The problem is type inference is formulated, usually by the academic community, is something where you have a complete program, and then you run the type inference system, and it tells you about type errors in your program. So it's a static analysis tool. This doesn't help if what we're trying to do is autocomplete the methods that are available to you because your program by definition is not complete. You're, not, you're writing the program. And so we had to adapt type inference systems to run for the first time on incomplete programs. And so this kind of thinking of sort of how do we use these sophisticated tools in the wild for novice programmers has, has presented a really radical shift in the way we approach even fairly traditional disciplines like compiler technology. For communication, which happens verbally, it happens through video, it happens through text, and obviously through 3D interaction. Our huge problem here, and the, the challenge for everyone, is just content moderation. Understanding what, what is being processed. What are people communicating? And in real time, so with minimal delay that, that would add friction to communication, can we decide if we're going to allow one player to express something to another player, or if we need to divert that because it's not constructive? Um, we had, since the beginning, you know, it's very easy to start with strong privacy, strong safety, strong moderation, and then roll that back for you know, over 13 users or, or for people who opt in. It's very hard to retrofit 
safety onto a system. And we're, we're seeing this now on sort of lots of different um, platforms on the web that have sort of run into this problem of, oh, we want to moderate now, but how do we do that? It wasn't built in. So we are fortunate that we started with it built in. Um, and what we've tried to do is selectively roll it back, but also selectively make it more sophisticated. Our initial moderation systems were all based on traditional natural language processing. These were rule-based parsing systems, um, lots of keywords, grammar, all that kind of stuff. And um, it was successful, but we had to be, we had to be very conservative because it, it's easy to thwart those systems. And so you have to take a lot of things and get a lot of false positives and say, I'm, I'm not sure what you're communicating. Maybe it's appropriate in this context, but I don't know. Maybe you're trying to circumvent the system, so we're not going to let you say that and we'll censor it. And what was really a revolution for us is when we adopted Distilbert, which is this is a transformer-based machine learning model. Um, Distilbert is a, is a serious compression of the large BERT system that's been very popular in NLP. Um, it was fairly fast for us to deploy that, and we saw an instantaneous 20% improvement over what had been a decade and a half of traditional NLP. And sort of in the course of a month, we got a 20% improvement over that whole system. Um, so that, that really opened our eyes to the potential of, of machine learning in this space, um, not just in terms of research results, but in terms of something that could be very quickly productized and create real value for users. Um, what our work in this space was, and that, that's what's described in the, those publications with the little squares next to them, was even the Distilbert system was way too large to deploy in practice. We're, we're running on you know, old Android phones um, that are mid-range devices. We're uh, running where we need to have really minimal server computation if we can get it in order to lower the cost of ownership in the data center to keep the platform free. And so we had to take uh, everything about those systems and squeeze down precision, squeeze down the number of parameters, the weights. Um, so the research really showed us the way and the results were, were immediately applicable. But then in order to productize these systems, and this is sort of been a lesson we've seen over and over for machine learning, um, mass, you know, orders of magnitude are usually needed between the proof of concept research system and what's deployable in terms of just minimizing state, minimizing communication to make it actually effective to use in practice. Um, so the quality was absolutely there. And then what we added was just on top of that, um, this sort of extreme compression of the system to make it deployable. Um, it's also interesting, I mentioned the, the 45 languages. Um, so we are running Distilbert we had to train it in 45 languages. I think the version we picked up had two or three. It was like French and English and a couple others. Um, so we had to expand that to, and especially some radically different languages. So where, where the grammar, you know, direction of text is different. Um, so lo lots of different kinds of processing to generalize. We also use GPT-3, and another sort of large um, machine learning transformer model, for doing natural language translation. Um, and this is on the creation side, not on the communication side, but it's another form of communication. So in most video games, they'll be authored in you know, German or Korean or English by the original developer. And then you hire a professional team to go through and take every button, every prompt, every line of audio dialogue and translate that into the languages you want to deploy in. Um, when I worked at Activision, you know, 10 languages was sort of a normal thing. It would take maybe a year for the translators to go through. Um, there's no way we can do that for user-generated content. We, we, you know, users push a button <laughs> and they want to deploy in, in seconds to the entire world. Um, so we, we can't have human translators just because of the lag it would put in the development loop for the user-generated content. Um, obviously, they can't we can't afford to have for millions of pieces of content that are being constantly revised to have human translation. And so we turned to GPT-3, and what's really neat is we were able to make it so that every piece of text that you put into an authored experience is automatically localized for all of the players around the world. And so this really facilitates content creation because you can author in your own natural language and have everything automatically adapted to run globally. Um, and obviously there's lots of things that happen behind the scenes with sort of automatic resizing of layouts and things to accommodate um, different text sizes. And of course for social 3D, um, 
facial expressions, hand gestures are super important. And so we, we've had uh, a really nice uh, set of results there. We, we showed these at, at SIGGRAPH last year. Um, and this will be shipping uh, fairly soon, actually, this year in the actual product. Um, so it's gone from sort of research to R&D um, to product in the course of about a year and a half. Taking natural video, so just from, from your webcam or from the, the selfie cam on your phone, so that might be at a very strange angle. It, it might be partly obscured. Um, might be in all different kinds of indoor, outer, uh, outdoor lighting conditions, and obviously with sort of the full range uh, of human appearance, and mapping that to directly controlling your avatar. So not just lip syncing, but if you raise an eyebrow, if you smile, um, that we can map that to your avatar's facial expression and do so in a natural feeling way, where your expressivity shows through, but you still have sort of a, a layer of anonymity and privacy that it's your avatar. It's not you personally appearing as video. And that's important when, you know, especially with, with the large number of children we have, if you're putting them in large environments, we want them to have that level of, of privacy and safety. Um, so, so here's an example of sort of the work behind that. Uh, it's also machine learning driven. As I said, this, this has been really transformative for our company, sort of uh, especially deep neural nets. So you can see the, the natural video on the left there, which is, which is never shown. That's just the debug view. And then we're mapping it to a character on the right. And what's impressive here is, again, not just the proof of concept research level of we can, we can get the quality we're looking for, so we can drive avatars directly. It works with user-generated content. So these aren't specifically rigged generated content. So these aren't specifically rigged faces. We can take any character on the platform, which is a constantly expanding set, and we can map any human face to them. And sometimes it, it, the mapping is a little bit indirect because you, they might not have facial features in sort of the normal way you expect, depending on the avatar. And then we optimize it to run so fast that we do this computation locally on a, a phone in a few milliseconds. So something like, like two to nine milliseconds, depending on the phone. So now let me talk about scaling, which is, is really the heart of everything. And to talk about scaling, um, my background, uh, largely for the last 10, 15 years, I, I was working on, on research for video game systems, so for real-time 3D on the rendering of physical simulations. So let me tell you a little bit about how those tr systems are traditionally built. So in a traditional 3D uh, multiplayer system, so if you get a game engine like, like Unreal Engine or Unity or in, any of the sort of leading 3D engines, they're basically structured like this. You have a central server, and you have a bunch of clients, and they're all just in a star network. And the game logic, so the event handlers, and everything that has to happen, the, the game programming, primarily runs on the server, as does all of the authoritative physics simulation. And then all of the rendering, which is you know, audio rendering, so 3D audio simulation propagation, as well as the visuals, um, and of that, shadows and lighting turn out to be something like 90% of the computation. And, and actually making the picture is, is relatively straightforward computationally um, compared to computing the lighting for it and compositing into the final frame. Um, so there's a, there's a pretty distinct division. And to hide some of the network latency, the ego camera, so your view, whether it's first person or, or third person, tends to be short-circuited and locally simulated, but it's not authoritative. So it's being overridden by the authoritative simulation from the server, and you're just being shown something that feels more responsive, even though it's actually not true, and that's not what the other players are seeing of you. And all of the assets, so 3D geometry, audio files, materials, those are all preloaded and, and stored on some kind of a local disk. So this is kind of the way game engines work today. Um, it's very good in terms of, since the authoritative computation is on the server, you can enforce many kinds of fairness and you can prevent many kinds of cheating in the system. So for competitive gaming, that's sort of why things have gravitated in this direction, to make it so that even if a client has been compromised, you can't exploit that to cheat in the game. The problem is, you have all of your central computation, so you're paying a lot for the server. The server's doing a lot of work. Um, you've incurred fairly high latency, which especially in VR is not good. So for an interaction, you have to go to the server in order to find out if you've picked something up. And so you have network scale latency, which is you know, maybe tens of milliseconds when you'd like to be down in single digit milliseconds. 
And you're not taking advantage of the fact that you have a distributed system, really. You, you've just kind of cut a, a pipeline in half. You haven't actually distributed the workload in any meaningful way. So in order to scale, Roblox has a, has a different architecture. And th this is what we built 16 years ago and have since refined. Um, so what we do instead is we actually distribute the computation in a fairly sophisticated way. Uh, both the game logic and the physics, as well as uh, parts of the audio and, and graphics rendering, are computed both on the clients and on the server. So if a player starts to get close to an object, their client takes over authoritative simulation of that object so that when they interact with it, it's maximally responsive. And this allows us to tolerate even seconds of latency in some cases without the per user perceiving any lag because they're simulating everything they're touching. And then when players start to get close together, that's where the sort of handoff and the load balancing gets a little bit complicated. Because we have all user-generated content and it's continuously changing, unlike a traditional video game, we can't preload, whether during a download or on disk, all of the content. And so we pull everything from a CDN. So there's a, a whole parallel network structure that's just streaming the static parts of the scene, so the, the assets down, um, rather than having anything preloaded. And this also lets us have, you know, we, you, you only need the working set to be stored in your handheld, so we don't consume the gigabytes and gigabytes of storage that traditional games have. Um, so this allows us to, to scale extremely well. Um, instead of scaling to, to tens of players like traditional engines do today, we can get to hundreds. But we currently artificially cap at 700 players because that's where we start to get to a, a cost of ownership on the server side. We can probably go a little bit further um, beyond that before we actually start maxing out the servers. So that's a really different approach um, to scaling that we're taking. Oops, sorry. Connor, I, I, I seem to have, uh, there we go, okay. Thank you. Um, and we've talked about this at, at, at a few conferences, mostly graphics conferences, um, some aspects of, for example, the lighting. So how do you do computer graphics, which is usually sort of the most um, you know, performance latency sensitive part, how do you distribute that computation without visible network style lag in the image itself? And the answer is that like I said, most of the work for computer graphics today is not about the final frame. Um, most of the work for computer graphics is about the lighting computations. And the lighting computations are generally not dependent on exactly where the player is. And in fact, in many cases, they're fairly latency uh, tolerant. They're fairly robust. And so we can compute these intermediate results in distributed way. Um, we might store that, for example, with the voxel lighting. We compute some of the most expensive shading on the server as sort of a 3D grid across the world. And that data is the same for everyone. So then we can press and stream it out. And uh, for shadows, it's another aspect where where the shadow appears on screen is unique for everyone. But where the shadow is in the 3D world is something that's the same for everyone. So in practice today, we're actually computing that locally and, and just caching it between frames for efficiency. But you could also distribute that computation into the cloud. So these are some of the kinds of ideas we're, we're working with for distributing the system. Like I said, it's gotten us about an order of magnitude above what um, traditional game engines can do today. But we want to go further. So I, I mentioned the, sort of these three grand challenges. And Scaling is the one that, that I obviously want to drill down in. So that was everything that, that we've already done, that's shipping, that stuff's live. Um, you can go to roblox.com and, and, and try it right now. Not right now, you, you have to wait till after the talk. But after the talk, you, you can go and get to that. Um, but what I want to talk about for scaling is, is something interesting where I'd mentioned, you know, this is a community that I've admired and I've been reading the, the NOSDAV and the multimedia and the multimedia systems papers for years. Um, and I've been learning a lot of, from them and seeing certain trends. And then I'm seeing, uh, especially on the, the video and audio streaming side, I'm seeing similar ideas emerging in the streaming 3D graphics side. So this is sort of the SIGGRAPH high performance graphics i3D communities. Um, but not enough communication between them. And I think they're converging in an interesting way that's worth explicitly calling out because I, I think that's a, a good place for future research. So if I, if I go back to that systems diagram of a game engine, what I'm going to do is, is sort of, I've taken away all the distributed stuff to, to make it neutral, but then we're gonna rebuild that in a second. 
Um, here are the functional units of that system, right? Regardless of where they're executing. And they're communicating with two data stores. One is the assets. And the interesting thing is this is mostly read only. So the 3D models and things, the animation of that isn't the model changing. That, that's data being applied on top of it as a transformation. And so all of that's fairly static. Um, it changes more frequently than games that are distributed on you know, DVDs or something. Um, but it's stable on the order of days, at least. So we, we put that in on the CDN, for example. Um, and then they communicate also with runtime state. So you notice I didn't draw any lines between the functional units. Um, I'm modeling them as they all talk to this big state block off to the side. And the interesting thing about the state, and this is why I've separated the physics and logic from the bottom half, is that only physics and logic write to the state. Those other parts are, are sort of read only to the state as well. So in fact, for that whole bottom part of the pipeline, data only comes in, it produces this ephemeral frame that's shown to the player and audio and maybe haptic feedback, and then it goes away. It never writes back. And that's kind of interesting from a, a streaming perspective, right? That, that's, a, that's a sync there as opposed to a source. And so we separate those conceptually two parts of our system as what we call the simulator and the renderer. And, and I think of renderer as both in the sort of, you know, 2D media sense of like I have a video renderer, an audio renderer that has to, has to get it out of the device, and in the, the 3D sense of it's doing lighting, it's doing shading, it's doing 3D audio propagation. And now I, I promised my whole talk was about the renderer, and this is the first time I said the word renderer. So um, I'm finally, like, we're finally getting to the payoff, I promise here. And I'm going to focus on the renderer, of course. And if we, we focus on the renderer, um, there's some interesting stuff when I look at you know, th this community and related communities in terms of related work, which is that uh, if we look at the, the state of the art for video compression, um, it's come a long way from you know, just sequences of, of frames or, or even you know, DCTs on frames. Um, so today we have, at, at the research state of the art, um, we have intra-frame information, the sort of self-similarity is being reused which in the 3D graphics community would just be called texture maps. Those are materials that are applied. Um, there are per block motion vectors, so we're capturing both camera gross motion and object motion within a frame and parallax, um, which is, again, they're 3D motion vectors and simulation. And in fact, there's even in a modern renderer an entire buffer of per pixel motion vectors that are computed from the physics system. Um, there's multi-channel 3D audio in, in modern video formats. Uh, 360 in stereo views so that you know, we can tolerate the latency of somebody moving in VR because we've streamed everything around them. And so we, we, we can locally just choose what we're viewing. Um, depth maps, quad trees, super resolution, um, adaptive bit rate. So all this sort of sophisticated stuff, regions of interest, which we saw in, uh, earlier in the keynote today. Um, these were all initially developed and sort of found their way into to HEVC and, and things like that. Um, from working with natural images. So, so something captured by a camera where we didn't have that data. But if we look at a Twitch game, um, so sort of you know, spectator game streaming or a cloud gaming service, it, it's not captured by a camera. It, it's, we, we produced the data. And so recovering a motion vector or a quad tree is really strange. We actually had exactly that information at perfect fidelity earlier in the pipeline. And then we threw it away. And so if you have the opportunity to treat the renderer not as a black box, but as we do in our system as that is the box that we're working on, um, then you can take advantage of that rather than having to recover. And, and so there's no error, there's no extra computation. And so if we think about the future of streaming media, the media stream shouldn't be a, a set of traditional blocks put together, but we should be working together towards building systems that are end-to-end -end aware of all the state they need in order to compress efficiently. Um, and, it, and it goes further. If we, so we look at it from the opposite direction, this is sort of some of the, the 3D graphics community work on, on exactly the same problem. Um, they're taking advantage of all, all of those things, as well as exploring new representations. So traditionally, most 3D graphics has, has gone to um, meshes and polygons and things like this. And that happened to, to deal with 
a specific quirk of the way that hardware acceleration coprocessors for graphics emerged about 25 years ago focused on that representation. Um, so it, it was very good for building hardware to produce final frames, but I just told you producing final frames is actually not the computational challenge today. It's, it's lighting and shading for 3D and for audio propagation. It's all of the, the reflections and simulations. And so a lot of this new work is looking at different representations, saying, well, wait, wait a minute, polygon meshes turn out to be terrible for machine learning and terrible for streaming, so maybe we need a better format and something that's more kind of 2.5D that looks like exactly the formats that the video community has been inventing, which are sort of these 2.5D of, of there's pixels, but they have a little bit of parallax or depth map. Um, so I see this converging in really interesting ways. Um, but my key point is not that we should work together. I mean, we should work together. But we shouldn't work together to make slightly better versions of the systems we, we've already built um, and then stream final frames of video because there, there's one more opportunity to seize and this gets back to the system diagram, which is don't stream the final frames, stream the intermediate results using these new hybrid 2.5D formats. Because if you stream intermediate results, then you can actually distribute the computation. Instead of just chopping your pipeline and finding a really efficient way to, to, to fill in the middle of the pipeline with a network, you can suddenly get thousands of nodes working on the same problem, the same simulation, and the same image generation together. And that's where you get the massive amortiza amortization, and that's where you can choose whether you're optimizing for latency or total cost of ownership, which computations to push towards the player or towards the server. So let me say that again with sort of a system diagram to make clear where I'm going. Um, so if you take sort of the traditional game engine, uh, it, it has, sorry, I'm a little out of sync between uh, two sets of slides here. Um, so the traditional game engine, it puts the whole renderer on the client. And, and everything I'm saying applies to simulation as well, but I wanna focus on the renderer because it, it's a little simpler to visualize the, the content. Um, so whole renderer on the client is low latency but we need to get the assets there somehow, and then there's this, this huge network latency for interaction. Um, but most importantly, this doesn't scale. Um, each client's workload is linear in the number of players. So if, if we put 10 times as many players, your poor iPhone now has to do 10 times as much graphics work. And I said they're currently at about 100 players, and that's really pushing it uh, on a mobile device right now. Um, I want to get 50,000 players. Your, your phone will just never scale there. You know, maybe it'll do 1,000, maybe it'll do 2,000, but there's some number beyond which it, the scaling doesn't. So it needs to be essentially constant in the number of players. So ultimately, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages of the system, but ultimately it doesn't scale, so no, you just can't do that. Um, but if we go the other way, and, and apologies, Mohammed. Um, video streaming from the cloud. And, and this is, and, and, I, and I'm joking, and, and calling out the earlier keynote, because it, that was great work, um, and it's exactly the kind of work that I think is what we need for these intermediate results. The, and, and I've worked on those systems as well at, at GeForce Now and NVIDIA. So cloud engines, which essentially create, um, they take the previous diagram, but then they virtualize the client itself into the cloud. They have a lot of advantages for solving the IT management problem. How do you install these things? How do you prevent cheating? Um, how do you provide security to the code? The problem is you have, you know, and there's, there's a network latency issue, but I think we're starting to get pretty good at that. Um, scaling, it, it's the same thing. This notion of you can render all of the game in the cloud and stream it down to the client, even on 5G, it doesn't scale if you're the cloud provider because you now have to pay n squared resources in the number of players, right? You have a linear number of, of cloud renderers you need to set up, and then each of those cloud renderers needs to have a linear number of players appear on them for the other avatars. And so this doesn't work as well in the long run. This, this is a great solution for how we bridge from traditional game engines to getting cloud computation to add value, but this isn't where we're going to be in 10 years. We, we need to get more sophisticated about the simulation and stop doing all the redundant work. So here's what I think the system should look like. Um, so the solution, of course, is not put the renderer on the client or put the renderer on the server, but that the network is the renderer, that the work is distributed. And so the interesting thing is within the data center, 
if we model these as sort of real servers, not virtual nodes, um, we, have, we have racks, we have servers with blades in them, and across those blades, we have fairly high bandwidth interconnects. So it, it's networking, but it's networking at phenomenal, you know, almost on uh, board rates. And what I envision doing is you, you take something like the audio computation, the lighting computation, the shadow computation, again, you do this for the simulation, and you're dividing it up so that essentially you have a whole server, a whole rack, a whole data center is not computing virtualized thousands of different instances of virtual worlds, but you program the entire thing to handle all of the worlds simultaneously. So one physical machine might be doing all of the lighting for multiple worlds, but then any one world is striped across all of the machines. It's kind of a computational equivalent of something like RAID for storage. And this gives you great resilience as well, because when one of those nodes go down, you lose shadows in 10% of the world until it load balances, but you don't lose the whole world. You don't have to reboot the way you do for traditional cloud computing. Um, and then this brings you to an idea that the renderer is now this cloud microservice that different applications can subscribe to. And it has that many to one aspect I just said. So any client is drawing from all of those nodes. Every user is getting a tiny fraction of a supercomputer from multimedia. Every server is handling many, many clients, and every world is also striped across all of them as well. And then when the clients connect, we can also migrate some of the computation. This is called serverless computing or serverless lambdas. The serverless should be in, in quotes because normally it's all about computation on servers. The point is it's just not tied to a, ser a specific server. And so migrating code between CPUs, between GPUs, between client and server allows us to take individual parts of either the renderer or the simulation and say, hey, this part needs to be really latency sensitive. Let's package that code up and ship it down and start running it directly on your phone right now to get lower latency. Oh, your phone is overheating because we put too much code. Let's send that one back up to the cloud. You're going to get a little more latency, but we can manage your power more efficiently now. So that's the serverless idea of let that code float between it. Because a huge component in our system is this big optimizing Lua compiler. Um, we happen to be sitting on a lot of technology for letting code migrate between different processors and different processor architectures. But in general, this is what um, essentially the whole cloud computing community is headed towards anyway. Um, WebAssembly on the server side has become really popular for this, for the notion of how do you make little code uh, bits that can float around. So this is the way that, that I think everyone is headed in the future. Um, and as I mentioned before, we can also, you know, the assets live on a CDN, and the state, which I previously not talked about, and, and hopefully in your head you were thinking of it's in RAM, um, the model of state in the future is it's a database. We have really great distributed databases. They need slightly lower latency than what most people are using, um, but essentially all state becomes something where you've just outsourced all of your RAM, and so you have these huge transactional databases. This is how most of Roblox works today. And that allows us to sync across whole global regions by just piggybacking on top of best of breed technology. So, you know, disk becomes CDN, RAM becomes distributed database, and your processor becomes a tiny fraction of a supercomputer spread around. So here's what that looks like, sort of with all the words taken away. Um, this is where I think the future is. And my challenge to, to this community, to the streaming 3D graphics community, is we need to invent the blue stuff. So all the things we've been doing for streaming final frames, we're starting to get down to like 1%, 2% improvements, because we've already tapped out all the entropy that was there. But if we look at intermediate results, if we say, well, how do we stream like the depth map that's used for shadowing rather than the depth map for the final image? How do we stream a bounding volume hierarchy? What does it mean to take, instead of a 3D mesh, to have kind of a 2.5D video image, and that's what an avatar is? That's, I think, the, the sort of the grand challenge future. If we can stream those things, um, again, the question is not where the computation runs, but how you move the state between the nodes. That's, that's where the real challenge. If you solve that, um, we already have great algorithms for what runs on the nodes, and most of them are embarrassingly parallel, but we just can't seize the parallelism because they can't communicate. 
Um, so here was the, the, the bibliography for that. I wanted to focus on the um, state diagram, um, some of which is, is things that we've started doing within Roblox that we're sharing. And this is far future work, so we're sharing this as openly as we can. We, we want to see everyone sort of create standards and innovate in the space together. Um, and I also want to acknowledge, uh, before I summarize, um, that the work that I've presented as Roblox also had many co-authors from academia, from other areas of industry. Um, and so, so these are some of the folks, especially uh, I would point out David Lubke at NVIDIA um, had a huge impact on, on sort of these ideas in this talk. Um, Arjun Guha at Northeastern um, and Derek Naruzi at McGill. And so in summary, um, today I, I told you about the Roblox platform, the scale that we're running at today. Um, about half of you were, were already familiar with Roblox. Uh, for the other half, because you're, you're not 13 or don't hang out with 13-year-olds, um, it's, probably, it's probably the biggest social media and 3D platform that you have never heard of. Um, so hopefully you will hear of it soon because we're trying to, to create experiences and age up in certain ways. Um, but it's a huge interesting problem and I think it's a great prototype for the kind of metaverses that many folks are interested in building. We have this creativity challenge. How do we unlock 3D interactive content creation for both novices but also allow professionals to work on the platform? And that's everything from 3D to compilers. The community challenge, which you might imagine, we spend huge amounts of effort just on, on moderation discovery, um, sort of you know, the bread and butter of any online community, making sure that it's, it's safe um, and that it's easy to find content you want. And then scaling is the existential challenge. So, We've shown that we can get an order of magnitude beyond where traditional game engines were by really being metaverse first, rather than sort of taking a traditional engine and trying to repurpose it. But we can see the limitations of that. It, it only got us one order of magnitude. And so to go beyond that, we need a radical re-architecture. And that was what I focused on with the renderer as this notion of let's rebuild um, 2D and 3D synthesis as serverless computing and distributed computing. And we really need to focus on this crucial problem of the interchange between different components. Um, that's gonna take advantage of existing hardware video encoders, sort of DSP-like ideas, all the frequency encoding, uh, all the amortization, and of course, machine learning is, is sort of the best new tool we have and, and also hardware accelerated. So thank you very much. It was great to talk to you and, and I'll be happy to take a few questions if we have time. Okay, so uh, we're going to take questions for uh, Morgan. So um, we have a few, I'm sure, lined up there on Slido. Mm -hmm. And uh, if anybody wants to ask a question from the audience, um, it just gives a wave and we'll be straight down to you. So anybody questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you very much for, for the talk. It was very insightful and uh, pretty new concepts for us. Um, I have a question about the the proposed uh, network rendering, mm -hmm. for instance, having, let's say, racks mm -hmm. for the audio server mm -hmm. or the, the shadow server or mm -hmm. something. Uh, you mentioned that the communication networks within the data centers are pretty like <laughs> uh, futuristic, yeah. but they are not necessarily homogeneous across data mm -hmm. centers. So mm -hmm. wouldn't the kind of scheme that you're proposing lead to a certain specialization within a data set or per data center? meaning yeah. that we wouldn't have much redundancy. If one data center mm -hmm. floods, your mm -hmm. shadowing server might <laughs> you know, die because it's not necessarily something that is spread across multiple geographical locations. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So heterogeneity of um, data centers. So what I'm primarily targeting is uh, what are so-called the, the hyperscalers. So this is, um, Roblox is like this. We, we build our own hardware from the ground up. I mean, we don't build the physical hardware, but we provision our own machines, we build out, we own the hardware in the data center. Um, obviously, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. So people at that scale who design um, not just, you know, I'm going to rent whatever facility is available to me, but I will co-design my data center and my software for it. Um, so for that environment, we have homogeneous data centers, homogeneous hardware, and in fact, we know exactly what the hardware will be when we're creating the algorithms. And so there's, there's never a mismatch. Um, in practice, we do have, um, so Roblox does, because we don't have the complete computational scale of, of like an Amazon, right? 1,600 of us. And, um, so 
what we do is we spill to sort of third party services and you see exactly the kind of degradation that you're describing and I think that'll get worse in the future. So if we have a, if we have a peak demand that exceeds our own built out capacity, we'll spill to AWS. And when we spill to AWS, we take a hit because it's not the hardware we were designed for. And obviously the systems are designed to, to accommodate that, but, but you can imagine like a jump in latency, for example, or a lowering of image fidelity. So I, I do think that assuming a heterogeneous external network is essential um, and, and you know, huge error bars and things like latency and bandwidth, right? When we're, when we're going to sort of the middle of, of a rural area in one country versus you know, the downtown urban center, completely different um, what the edge compute looks like there. Uh, but I think for the kind of systems I envision, yes, you have to assume that you have control over the network within the data center and that you're building to its specs and that's exactly compensated for. So great point, thank you. Uh, very good, so I'm gonna take a, a question there just from Slido. Mm -hmm. um, so this one's from Mark Claypool and it's since the Robox client uh, up, takes over at least some authoritative computations for scaling, how does it prevent cheating? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the advantages I pointed out of traditional game engines was that because they don't do any authoritative client-side compute, um, they, they're they very hard to cheat. Now it turns out people still cheat because the, there's sort of great incentives there, and in some cases, especially in the professional esports league, it's, it's financial level incentive. Um, and, and so my own research has been on specifically ways of thwarting that. And we do something very similar to the way that, that eSports uh, cheating is thwarted, but we happen to have a little bit better data, which is um, to look at, at eSports to identify cheating where somebody has hacked their client, um, and that'd be cases like they're, they're modifying the local renderer so they can see through a wall, so they get extra information. In many cases, they're using fairly sophisticated machine learning systems that look at the final frames and then feed artificial mouse input. So it could auto-aim if you're, you're in sort of a targeting-based experience. Um, so what tho the way those systems work for eSports outside of Roblox is they look for um, you know, a characteristic tell of not just superhuman performance, because the best players perform at levels that are well above sort of what an average player would be. It'd be like if you said somebody can't compete in the Olympics because they, they run faster than anybody in your high school gym class. Well, of course they, they do, they're professional. Um, but you look for things where it's sort of not just above the average human threshold, but either exceeding a, a possible human threshold um, statistically, or where it has a pattern that doesn't match the pattern of human activity. And so there, there's a machine learning arms race here, much like there was for CAPTCHAs, with can someone, you know, can the machine pretend to be human, and then can we detect someone trying to pretend to be human? Um, so we do something similar. We look for kinds of interactions that aren't characteristic for the experience. So we can, for example, I'm not saying, because this is a security question, I don't wanna go into too many details, but you can imagine looking at things like, hey, is the physics simulation conforming to the kind of velocities that we expected, the kind of masses that we expected? Um, anything transactional is, of course, done on the server of the transactional databases, so we, we can avoid those, but there, there's issues like, can you harass someone or cause grief by you know, causing a smoke screen to appear where it shouldn't have been? So it doesn't affect the world transactionally, but it does affect people's experience. So a lot of that we're looking for qualitatively, what we're envisioning doing in the future, and this is where the, the serverless computing is really important, is moving to a world where um, different parts of code can be analyzed, essentially using that type inference system for properties not just like what are the set of values that this type could have, um, but looking at properties like, well, is this a piece of critical state for the program? If it is, any code that touches that will get automatically migrated to the server to protect it from exploits. Whereas if we determine, oh, this is, this is merely cosmetic or there's sort of bounded impact on the player experience, that's code that we can migrate down to the client to run for reduced latency in the computation. And so this is another reason that being able to move code back and forth is really important. Um, exploit as well as latency and cost of ownership is another sort of key axis for us. Uh, that's good stuff, so I'll go, uh, yep, Sam, yeah. Thanks, thanks for the interesting talk, really. Uh, I've just, my question was basically uh, Mark's, but uh, on another notion. So you're uh, dumping some of the author authority on the client, but if you have a 
a set of, I don't know, five clients, mm -hmm. and they're trying to interact with a ball, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you decide on which client do you drop it, and then that client has a bit of an advantage, or how, is it, how does that work? Yeah, so the handoff between clients essentially works where if you're touching something, you are definitely simulating it, unless it's a multiple physics constraint, which is, there's already a part of physics systems that deal with sort of over-constrained stuff. Um, so you basically you can simulate on both ends and then resolve it in the middle. Um, but if you're touching something, your client takes over. And in general, there's sort of like a, a radial projection of as you get closer to touching things, you take it over. Um, latency of things that you are not touching that are not moving ballistically. Ballistic movement, like catching a ball, is easy because once it's started, you can predict it very well. And so it doesn't matter who simulates it, they'll all get the same result because we you, know, you dead reckon and compensate for latency. Um, so if you're not moving ballistically and it, it's not being touched by a client, people are extremely resistant to the latency. So, so there's high latency in, you know, for example, the water glass in front of you. If you're moving it, it doesn't really matter if I see your movement with high latency if I, there's no way for me to interact. And so it's, it's analogous. We think of a lot of these things because we, we run, we use physics as our transaction system. This is what lets us build a metaverse. M most games, if there's a car, there's no engine in the car, there's no gears, there's no physics. It's, it's sort of magic code saying how it moves. In Roblox, it's all run with physics. The reason we do that is that you can take the car from one experience and put it in another, oops, another experience that wasn't designed for the car. And there, it doesn't need any special code to know how to handle cars. Physics handles the transaction. And so it's just like in the real world. Physics is, is sort of what lets things interoperate arbitrarily. Um, so in that context, we think about a speed of sound and a speed of light. And you could kind of think of that analogy where if the speed of light was much slower um, because it's running over a network rather than, you know, even though ironically it's probably a fiber optic network that is light. Um, Right? The light maybe takes, in, in, instead of the millisecond, maybe it takes you know, 300 milliseconds to get from you to me because of the network hop. But it's all consistent for me. Everything that's happening where you are is happening at the same delay. And for you, it's a very low delay because you're simulating it locally. And so in general, except for that, the special case of ballistic movement where dead reckoning takes over, or I'm touching it and so I own it, um, as long as you're consistent about the latency, so different objects at the same distance have the same latency, it's actually imperceptible, except you know, in, in the same way in the real world as the speed of sound and speed of light. Good observation, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do, just in the interest of keeping time, um, is we're gonna go to the break, and if anybody has any other questions for Morgan, uh, we can maybe have a chat during the coffee break. Um, so just before we wrap up, I just want to say it was a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very interesting stuff. And uh, I suppose I request a round of applause because, uh, yeah, I think it was very, very interesting. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>